Okay, well, it's 8.30 now, so I suggest we start. Um, so welcome, everyone. Good morning, maybe good evening to most of you. Uh, my name is Jana Podkosova. I'm a postdoc at the Wien Technical University of Vienna in Vienna, Austria. So I'll chair this session. And um, well, I guess we'll start now with the first paper. Without further ado, uh, the first paper is uh, called Investigating How Speech and Motion Realism Influence the Perceived Personality of Virtual Characters and Agents. And the authors are Sean Thomas, Ilva Festel, Rachel McDonald, and Kath Ennis. And Sean Thomas will present. So please, Sean, the floor is yours. Great. Is that all working now for you? Cool. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Sean from Dublin, Ireland, and today I'll be presenting our work on investigating how speech and motion realism influence the perceived personality of virtual characters and agents. Uh, the portrayed personality of virtual characters and embodied conversational agents is largely understood to influence how we perceive and engage with digital applications. Uh, particularly for 3D virtual worlds, the portrayed personality of these characters may be impacted by both verbal and nonverbal communication features. For individuals represented by avatars with generated nonverbal behaviors, this could lead to a misrepresentation of their personality through unintentional dampening or abstraction. And understanding how fidelity of a, sorry, understanding how the fidelity of various modalities impacts personality portrayal can also support the development of targeted personalities for interactive and 3D UI agents. Our aim is to understand the impacts of different levels of speech and motion realism on the perceived personality of virtual characters and embodied conversational social agents, according to the Big Five personality inventory. And so, using stimuli created from multiple performance capture data sets, we explore the effects on three female and three male avatars, each created using the Ready Player Me platform and portrayed by a unique actor. Our stimuli feature two motion conditions, a natural motion condition that consists of full body performance capture and a robotic motion condition that uses performance capture for the gesture stroke phase with synthesized transitions for the arms plus idle body motion for the remainder of the body. We also have two voice conditions. Uh, first, our natural voice condition consisting of real audio recordings corresponding to the performance capture animations, while our robotic voice condition consists of text-to-speech generated from the transcriptions of the real natural voice recordings. So using our created stimuli, we conducted five experiments to assess multiple features that may contribute to a character's perceived personality. First, we have an appearance only experiment in which characters are rated solely on appearance through a series of static images. Second, we have a text only experiment in which transcriptions of each character's speech are rated according to linguistic features Third, we have a voice-only experiment in which our voice conditions are rated in isolation. Fourth, we have a motion-only experiment in which our motion conditions are portrayed by our characters, but without audio. And finally, a multimodal experiment combining all modalities to understand the amalgamated influence of all channels. So let's take a look at some of the samples of our stimuli across various conditions. You know they could do it but they will never because it it it's part of the game like also these errors here because it's also then you know when when you are a fan of this team or that team you will start complaining no it was here it was not then inside that was red that was not he, he didn't so I absolutely adore traveling and I've been lucky luckily enough throughout my my college years that I've done a fair amount of traveling so I kinda I needed I knew if I was going to do something after college, I needed to get the traveling out of my system now, just to make between ricotta and cream cheese. Okay. And you like you can make it sweet or savory. Okay. And so it's used in desserts and then also in like pastas as a thickener. Okay. Yeah. But it's like you a mascarpone and cocoa filling between the cocoa. He's hiding from him at first. He's hiding from like the dream person at first because he's like, okay, well, I don't know if like that will mess up with reality or something, but I'm going to stay hidden. After a little bit, he notices that like, you know, the guy doesn't notice him or something. He's looking. At so the participants in our experiment were shown an assortment of stimuli in random order through our in-house experiment, in-house experiment system. 
then asked after each clip to rate the character's personalities on a seven point Likert scale, according to the 10 item personality inventory. Following this, the 10 item scale was collapsed to be assessed according to the big five inventory. Our results show that processing of speech and motion can have both enhancing and reducing effects on personality traits. Our results show that it is important for portraying, sorry, that motion is important for portraying extroversion as we observe that robotic motion is perceived as less extroverted and more conscientious, perhaps due to less communication of nonverbal messages. On the other hand, we observe speech as essential for communicating the agreeableness and emotional stability of a character. The robotic voice or text-to-speech was rated as less agreeable and overall for agreeableness, voice realism was more impactful than that of motion. For emotional stability, voice realism had a significant effect, but only in the multimodal setting. Our extensive results, which are fully documented in our paper, support the proposal of guidelines when designing characters and agents with targeted personalities, such as using higher fidelity motion to more accurately portray extroversion, using higher speech realism to portray higher, uh, sorry, higher agreeableness, and using lower fidelity motion to represent higher conscientiousness. A complete set of our results uh, are available in the full paper. There are still, however, uh, future work considerations that could be explored, uh, such as making use of data sets containing facial motion capture and finger motion data, obtaining self-perceived personality profiles for each actor, uh, that, that's in the data set, uh, exploring personality perception for user adaptive interactive agents. So we could run an interactive study to see effects, and the study could be translated to virtual reality. Uh, so we could understand how does immersion and presence augment our observations. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, you can feel free to get in touch with our team if you have any questions. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sean. It's an excellent presentation. I guess everyone agrees. So <clears throat> let's start with a question. Let's start with questions now. I saw this one with uh, with the chat that uh, someone asked, "How did you analyze your data, Sean?" I believe it is in the paper, but uh... yes, it is. Yeah. Hey, uh, so we analyzed uh, using ANOVA, and we did some normality tests. And when the assumption of normality was violated, we then used an aligned rank transform. And uh, I have a question. I don't know, like any, any follow-up questions to that? Yes, please, Thomas. Maybe, would you think that the kind of the semantic content inside the text that they had to read or that was presented had any kind of influence on character rating? If, I guess it was within subject design, right? So every subject was exposed to each different condition and or each different, uh, um, yeah, modality. Um, would yeah, yeah, have an influence on what they were saying on the character rating. Yeah. So Thank you, Thomas. Did... I'm sorry. So, like, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry. Apparently, we are supposed to ask all the questions at the end. So, <laughs> let's switch to that mode. Of course. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So then we'll proceed to the next uh, paper and the next presentation. Uh, the next paper is called Spatial Updating in Virtual Reality, Auditory and Visual Cues in the Cave Automatic Virtual Environment. And the authors are Christiane uh, Breitkreutz, Jennifer Braid, Sven Winkler, Alexander Bendixson, Philip Klimant, and Georg Jan. And Christiane will present. Please. One second, please. I'm not sure why, but I can't share my presentation oh, yeah. right now. Um, okay. Um, one second, it just worked of before, course. so I'm just opening it again to make sure. There it is. Mm -hmm. um. Uh. 
Uh, one second. Um, I can't uh, start the presentation. I'm very sorry. Um, does somebody know how to move the tuba a little bit on uh, a side or somewhere else? So. Uh, also, if it'd be easier for you, Christiana, then Lauren could play it for you. Um, yes. I was really prepared to do this, but I just can't get the presentation started. Just, uh, One of Christian, the buttons within the Zoom might allow you to. You just press, press F5, as, as you would usually do? No, it's just activating the light on my keyboard. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you think it might be due to the office? Uh, well, and uh, no, the, the reason is just the toolbar from Zoom is completely um, yeah, just go down. Disabling to the, my buttons. Christiane, oh. if you just want to go down to the bottom right, next to where there is like the scroll bar, that next one in. Yeah. Yes, I got it. Thank right. you very much. No problem. Perfect. So thank you for your patience and the kind introduction before. Uh, hello from Germany. My name is Christiane Breitkreuz. I'm a postgraduate student at Chemnitz University of Technology. And I'm presenting to you our paper as part of an interdisciplinary team on supporting spatial orientation and spatial updating in projective virtual reality systems. I welcome my colleague Jennifer Brade, who's also present in the Zoom session today. Our study was conducted in the framework of the DFG-founded Collaborative Research Center Hybrid Societies within subproject zero. C02, which deals with the investigation and improvement of spatial orientation in synthetic environments. So now let's start. When we move to a real environment, egocentric location representations are effortlessly and automatically updated through the integration of numerous cues about one's own body movement and movements in general from different modalities. When moving in synthetic environments, this effortless and continuous spatial updating is often disrupted or incomplete due to a lack of sensory, especially body-based movement information. To prevent disorientation in virtual reality caused by missing body-based information, the support of spatial updating where other sensory movement cues is necessary. Previous studies have mostly investigated the effect of type and combinations of different locomotion techniques or the addition of visual cues such as optical flow or landmarks. Other studies presented wind as an haptic cue or try to stimulate the vestibular system. However, the influence of the auditory modality on spatial updating in virtual and reality, especially with simulated self-motion has hardly been studied so far. Since auditory cue, cues have received little attention for support of spatial updating in synthetic environments, our research question is whether a continuous, spatially adapted auditory signal can support spatial updating when body-based cues are missing inside a projective virtual reality system. Therefore, we conducted a within-subject study in a sparse virtual environment of the triangle completion task. We used three different condition, conditions. Either no orientation cue was available or three different looking distant trees were presented or um, an auditory so sound source which was, which was not visible played spatialized music. We included the visual condition for comparison. However, the focus of our study is not the direct comparison of auditory and visual localization ability. Instead, we addressed the question whether the auditory stimuli can support the task similarly as the visual stimuli. Our study was conducted inside a five-sided cave with an edge length of three meters, which was placed at Chemnitz University of Technology. As you can see, a cave is a combination of several projection screens, creating a cube-like shape in which the user resides. A sound projector developed by Technische Universität Dresden was placed behind the user at the open side of the cave. We used a Xbox 360 controller as interaction tool with the virtual environment. 20 people participated in our study. Now I will show you a short video of a trial in the visual condition. So in our triangle completion task, 
uh, the participant started the trial by pressing a button, was then automatically moved along the first side of a triangle, was turned, and afterwards the participant was moved along the second side of the triangular path before he or she was asked to navigate him or herself back to the assumed start position. This was done 24 times in the respective pew condition, which were numerically evenly distributed across three experimental blocks and presented in random order. We analyzed, um, we analyzed in our three experimental conditions the performance of the triangle completion task as distance between indicated and actual start position. So a shorter distance to the actual start position means here a better task performance. The mean distance was lower in conditions with an orientation cue present. A repeated measures ANOVA confirmed this effect of orientation cue. A pairwise comparison with Bonferroni corrected alpha level indicated a, a better task performance in the visual cue condition and in the auditory cue condition compared to the no cue condition. The numerically, the slightly numerically advantage you can see in the auditory condition compared to the visual condition was not reliable in our experiment. The overall pattern just shown with the best performance in the auditory condition uh, just applied to 60% of our participants. The remaining 40% had their best performance in the visual condition. Surprisingly, in eight cases, one of the conditions with an orientation cue presence, so either auditory or visual, had not an increased performance compared to the no cue condition. So let me summarize. Our results indicate that visual and continuous auditory cues can improve spatial orientation in a sparse virtual environment, and thus the performance in the spatial updating task in the absence of body-based movement information. Large inter-individual differences were revealed in the improvement by auditory and visual cues, which should be kept in mind when interpreting the trend in mean value across all participants. There are still many things to investigate, such as the underlying factors of those inter-individual differences in cue usability, or also the influence of cue positioning and cue properties. It would be also interesting to have a look at the influence of participant strategies or given instructions. Another interesting approach for future studies might be the use of auditory stimuli as a body-related auditory feedback of a movement. So overall, let me finish to say that auditory orientation cues have a great potential to improve spatial orientation in the absence of body-based movement cues. So thank you everyone for listening and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, Christiane. It's an excellent presentation. So please, I, I would like to encourage everyone to post your questions in the Discord channel or also here in the chat if it's more comfortable to you. They will be transferred well, to a location where I can uh, access them all at the end of the session. We will do a question, uh, all the question session in the end. Thank you. So um, the next paper Hello, is called Audience yeah. Thanks for tuning in to okay, our IEEE VR 2022 presentation on audience experiences of a volumetric virtual reality music video. My name is Gareth, and I'm a research fellow on the vSense project at Trinity College Dublin. Today I'm going to talk about our pilot study that asks, are users concerned about the attractiveness of volumetric music video content, as well as the pragmatic and hedonistic qualities? And what are the latent needs and emotions of audiences, and what are the problems they face? With the rise and fall in popularity of music videos over the last few decades and the influence of personal tastes during those times, the form and function of music videos has also been in a constant state of flux. It is, therefore, no surprise to us that musicians that can adapt to change in musical styling can also deem it necessary to release immersive media for fans to explore their music in new and innovative ways. In our paper, we first posed the question, what is your favorite music video? And in response, I'm sure you all have various answers depending on the decade you were born. Feel free to drop a comment or a link to your favorite music video below. 
In more recent times, we're seeing a resurgence of extended reality technologies, as well as the use of 3D volumetric reconstruction. Constant change in media formatting and consumption means that we are presented with music videos that continue to shift and transform in new and inventive ways. At the time of this presentation, examples of these 3D reconstruction techniques in music videos can be seen in Billy Corgan's Aeronaut and Tino Kamal's VIP. However, we predict that more examples of volumetric music videos will be available in the near future. With all of these changes and the ebb and flow of audience tastes, in our paper, we take stock of the current market to capture audience responses to such materials that are available today and try to articulate these findings to inform new working approaches to designing and delivering volumetric music videos. For our experiments, we chose the track Not Get from Bjork's Volnikura album, as it demonstrated several excited volumetric features. Firstly, the genre of music would be accessible to most music listeners, whilst the track would also remain relatively unknown. We could also view two different professionally produced visual interpretations of the track, one as a traditional screen-based music video, and two as an immersive virtual reality experience. In this experiment, we compared a traditional TV viewing platform with an immersive VR experience. Therefore, in a random order, the participants watched the 2D and 3D version of the track not get and reflected upon this experience via previously validated questionnaires and open-ended questions. In late 2021, we sought volunteers from Dublin, Ireland. Due to COVID restrictions, we could only safely process 13 participants before another lockdown prevented further testing. We categorized our participants as novices, end users, and advanced users by applying a user cube approach. It's also worth noting that the average age of the cohort was 30 years old. After experiencing both scenarios, we asked our participants which platform they preferred and why. In this case, the group was evenly split between viewing by a traditional TV screen and a VR device. A thematic analysis of responses to why revealed that participants talked about their visual understanding and familiarity with TV screen media as a more traditional format. On the other hand, those who liked the VR platform more talked about immersion and its unique affordances in live music performance. When asked to evaluate the VR experience, which is the focus of our current work, the participants rated the platform's attractiveness, perspicuity, stimulation and novelty highly. However, the perceived efficiency and dependability of VR were rated lower. These measures indicated that users applied unnecessary effort during the VR experience and did not feel securely or predictably in control of the interaction. Finally, we asked the group to report on their previous experiences of volumetric video in VR, their thoughts on improving future VR music videos, and the advantages and disadvantages of using VR in musical performance. By our thematic analysis, we discovered that this particular cohort displayed varied previous experiences with volumetric video and different forms of creative VR uses. They also expressed that they had previously accessed these types of materials across multiple devices. The most common improvement that VR music videos could make to the music scene was the accessibility of live performance and its ability to reach wider audiences. Following this, it was suggested that these types of digital media could bring an increased level of intimacy to remote or telepresent live performance. Moreover, the impact of the Uncanny Valley effect was raised as another potential area for improvement. The advantages and disadvantages of VR music videos presented several core themes, highlighting the importance of live musical experiences, the audience's perspective, the performer's perspective, current industry trends, and the way technology is presently being used in general. These user-identified factors will provide a foundation for our future work in creating quality volumetric music video experiences, including the use of narrative experiences that support first-person perspectives. Our concerns highlighted the potential conflict between conventional linear narratives and those that allow freedom of exploration, such as are afforded in VR. We also acknowledge that our participant group was somewhat small, gender-weighted, and contained more advanced users than novices. Therefore, we proceed with some caution to highlight the specific qualities that audiences seek whilst consuming such materials. Still, we move forward to designing and creating a new volumetric music video experience with the Irish band New Pagans, and plan to conduct broader, more inclusive user studies with these materials in the future. Thanks for taking the time to listen to this presentation, and we hope you gain more insight from reading our paper. 
We look forward to hearing any questions you may have during the conference and welcome you to follow our updates on this project via our website and social media channels. Thank you. Glad that worked. Thank, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, so please um, can uh, post your questions for a little bit later on the channel, and now we'll move to the final presentation in the session. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I, I seem to have lost the, the paper in the list of papers. <laughs> I think it's me, right? I can already go yeah, if you want. Please, yeah, please, please, Thomas, go ahead. Everyone's uh, looking forward to your presentation. Okay, so hi everyone, I'm Tom, and uh, I'm going to be presenting uh, our general paper comparing direct and indirect methods of audio quality evaluation in virtuality scenes of varying complexity. So. This is really kind of just a teaser. There's a lot to cover in seven minutes, like with everyone's. And uh, yeah, please check the paper out if you want to know more details. Um, so a bit of uh, background, motivation and context. Subjective audio evaluations, what do we use them for? We want to kind of optimize, optimize different algorithms. We want to check that things actually sound good. And we use them for setting industry standards for certain technology as well. Things like uh, MPEG H, MPEG I, some of you may have heard of this. Um, the context of 60 degrees of freedom is different than unimodal audio presentation. So we now have what's called multi-sensory integration. That's the combination of all these different sensors, uh, which combines to uh, create our perception of the world. But we can also have multi-sensory integration conflicts. That's when things like audio and visual things don't match or our proprioceptive cues don't match with our auditory input. Um, we also have new levels of interaction. So we can move around inside 6.3R. We can actually interact with different objects with the controllers and so on. What's important to note is that the choice of method can actually directly influence our ability to detect any significant differences in the conditions that we're actually evaluating. And no standardized method exists yet, which explicitly accounts for these new things inside 6.VR. And one other thing that's important to note is that VR seldom has an actual ground truth reference. So there's no like real life cave that I can model in CGI and then go to the real life cave, or I could do, but it would be very, very costly. Um, so a bit more about methods, we have direct scaling methods. Some of you may know things like Mushra or BS1116 scale. So we have like a scale from zero to hundred and you can put a slider there to show kind of your like your estimated magnitude of perceived sensation or attributes. Uh, this is pretty simple to do in terms of statistics. You can do something like an ANOVA, like we heard from Sean. And uh, we could also do indirect scaling. So indirect scaling is kind of like a comparative process where you then have like a, a number of A, B, C, D and D of conditions and then you eliminate them for for example and then you construct a scale after the fact to show like relative distances of your conditions um, and we want to leverage here the discrimination is is kind of easier for subjects than it is for absolute judgment so people from a psychological standpoint i can ask you which one of these colors is the, is bluer of these or i could ask you how orange is this word absolute from a scale from the least orange to the most orange and it would be very difficult for you to answer that question um, but the, we, we have also no scaling or labeling biases here for indirect scaling because there is no kind of scale involved, but there's more complicated statistics involved. Um, in practice, we want to make sure that the method we use is reliable. It's easy for the subject to use who's actually doing the test. It's easy for the administrator and it fits the context, which is kind of the focus of this study. So what methods fit the context of six degrees of freedom VR for audio evaluation? Uh, this is kind of our paradigm. So we have a mix between and within subject test design. So we have four different test methods, two direct scaling, two indirect scaling, MSHR, MS, EBA, and PC. And I'll come on to those in a second. You'll see what they are. 17 subjects per test method. So 68 subjects in total. They actually do two test sessions for each different method. So HRTF spatial conditions, HRTF free, uh, frequency conditions. Uh, for these sessions, basically what we do is we have a HRTF, a head-related transfer function, and we degrade them on different dimensions, which are important for binaural audio. Um, and what we actually evaluate is five different VR scenes of kind of varying complexity. So it could be a static sound source, it could be an animated sound source that moves around, it could be a sound source that you interact with, and essentially just to kind of cover the most, the, the broadest spectrum of VR content. 
The methods that I mentioned, uh, I'm going to keep this like legend up here so we can have it all throughout the presentation. Direct scaling, I mentioned MSHR. This is kind of like a musher, if anyone's heard of a musher before. It's a multiple stimulus with hidden reference. Uh, there's no anchor. And you basically can compare all these conditions against the reference signal. So the reference is the best that anything could possibly be. And then all the conditions are rated against that. Uh, multiple stimulus, MS, is, is very similar. It's still a direct scaling method, but there's no reference. So everything's kind of relative against one another. And it could be influences like your own internal reference that are also accounted for here. But in direct scaling, we have what's called elimination by aspects. This is essentially a rank order style method where you eliminate things from worst to best. So you go from A through to E and say what's worst and what's best. And, and then you have pairwise comparison. I guess that's a lot of you will have heard of this, where you essentially have two different conditions. You go through all the unique different possible comparisons of those conditions and you say which one's worst and which one, which one's best and which one's worst. Uh, for here, there's a slider, but what I actually do is I binarize these. So it's actually just turned into ones and zeros. The slider actually doesn't matter. Um, I'll move on to the results. Uh, we're only, on a, we're only going to look at the HRTF spatial results because there's just so much to look at. Um, we have the results here for uh, direct scaling across the top and across the bottom we have the indirect scaling. Um, the, on the x-axis we essentially have the different conditions in terms of spatial degradation and frequency degradation. Uh, without going into too much detail, the further to the left is the higher quality, further to the right is the, is the worst quality, or hypothetically. Um, and the main thing I want to point out in this short time is the number of significant differences that was discovered through the postdoc analysis. Again, you can read about the statistics in the paper. Uh, for the with a reference, we have a kind of a healthy number of significant differences for all the different scenes we evaluated here for the with a reference uh, for this MSHR. But then when we don't have a reference inside virtual reality, what do the, what do the kind of results look like? And for MS here, for this direct scaling method, we have a reduced number of significant differences. There's also a difference in terms of the scale usage, and it's much more compressed, so there's a bit more bias or, or scale usage involved in, in these subject ratings. Then inside indirect scaling, we have really the same or if not more significant differences than that with MSHR. So this indirect scaling method proves to be pretty good at yielding good um, significant differences with the conditions that you're presenting. Um, but the story is not the same with powerwise comparison here, so you have kind of a really low number of significant differences told. Again, I discussed more about these results and also the HRTF frequency results inside the paper. Um, so more analysis, we do a NASA TLX questionnaire after every scene, uh, also with the different, um, different methods. Uh, so this is kind of a, a questionnaire that evaluates mental demand. And um, we can see that the EBA is, is much less mentally demanding than when you have a reference involved with the MSHR method. So it requires less mental demand, it requires less effort. So Overall, the EBA is looking pretty solid. Um, we can move on to the behavior results. So I did some more talk about this in the paper again, but the pairwise comparison took really a long time to go through all those different unique pairs. I mean, because this is just an average. So for some people, it took like two hours, which is a nightmare. But for the EBA, it was really a low number, a reduced number of time. It was really good. Sequential elimination of the conditions. So eliminating A, then being able, or, or B and C, and then being able to just concentrate on two really kind of saves the time and helps the subject concentrate on, on what's actually difficult to, to, to hear. Um, there's some further discussion inside the paper regarding the scene complexity, influence of physical demand in the scenes that you had to interact with, the movement behavior, and also some comments regarding individualized and generic HRTFs, which might spark some people's interest. Um, and there's some limitations regarding the complexity of the audio rendering that we did. It was very simple, basically. Um, the main conclusions or takeaways is that the EBA produces a number of significant differences, similar or in some cases more than with MSHR, so when a reference is available. Uh, there's benefits to the sequential elimination of conditions, requires the least amount of time, and it makes the most efficient use of subjects' movements. Um, the EBA requires less mental demand and less effort than MSHR. And there's no scaling biases or misinterpretations as with direct scaling, or there could be with direct scaling, should I say. So that's kind of the main takeaways that I could get in this short time. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. So yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, Thomas. Great work and very comprehensive. So um, now finally, we have time sometime for questions. And I see there are already plenty. So I suggest we start with questions in the order of presentation. So first questions will be for Sean. And a question from Thomas. 
that we interrupted, do you think semantic content has any influence on the different ratings? Yeah, so we, we did hypothesize that emotional language uh, would have an effect on how some traits were communicated. And what we saw through our text only study was that uh, there were effects on most traits, but not on conscientiousness. Um, so extroversion, emotional stability, et cetera, would have been somewhat affected by semantic content. Mm -hmm. But then again, uh, the participants were reading text. So it's, it's again, difficult to say which mm -hmm. part of that text may have uh, created those effects. So uh, yeah. Thank you. And, uh, I don't know if anyone wa else wants to comment it right away. We do have quite many questions. Um, the next question is by Lauren Buck. Uh, and the question is, would, it be, uh, would you possibly think about doing this experiment with avatars that have mismatching vocals? For example, male avatar with female voice. And do you think this would change the perception of personality? I think it's possible that it could. Um... I mean, we did find male characters to be more agreeable. Um, so there's a potential difference there. Um, who knows for sure until we try it. But yeah, I think that could be a really valuable uh, study. So definitely useful idea. If male, uh, were male ca characters more agreeable in, in all conditions or just in multimodal conditions or overall? I'm wondering if the if the contribution is from the appearance alone or from the combination of everything, the appearance and voice. What was it again? Um, I <laughs> think it was a general one. I, I'm not too sure on yeah, the spot. That's okay. Uh, definitely, case everyone can also look it up in the paper. It'd be interesting direction to to see, like maybe what what element Absolutely. contributes to this agreeableness. Okay, so now the next questions are for Christiana. Although, like, well, feel free to still come up with questions for Sean. So the first question is, what was the stimuli for the auditory signal? And did it contain transients or something like continuous pink noise? Okay, um, so we used a free available short and steady music clip with no climax or any salient sound. So we did not want the participant to realize when the music clip starts and begins when we loop it. This was really important to us. And if you like, I could just play the clip and share my screen again. Well, well if we can do that really shortly, let's do that, I guess. <clears throat> okay, well, I can also listening to the next sorry. question while I'm doing it. Mm. Let's see. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, ah, so I could play it right now. Yeah, go ahead. So something like that. I hope the quality was OK. I guess there was an overlay with my mic, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Thank so you. I think the quality was stage. good. OK. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. And then another question for you: Did you ask, <clears throat> did you ask participants regarding their preferences via questionnaires or interviews or both mixed? Yes, we did an interview at the end of the session with each participant, and there we also asked how they perceived the visual and the auditory stimulus and how useful they were for the task for them. And the answers were really uh, broad. Uh, so some of the participants mentioned that they like the auditory stimulus but could use it others said they used it for orientation it was helpful and the same applies to the visual stimulus so for some participants they said they were useful and others said they are were confusing so they tried to not to look at them which was not possible yeah i can see from my very limited personal experience then it's really very much a matter of preference and maybe a personal mm -hmm. sense for audio when it comes to, to audio. It's much, mm -hmm. much less also, universal than video. Yeah, yeah, we also tried to categorize their answers and did a correlation if there's any uh, uh, yeah, influence of the mm -hmm. pre preference and the received usefulness, but we did not find any correlation between the performance in a perspective condition and their answers. 
Um, oh yeah, well, I guess uh, you already touched on the next question. Do you have any ideas or guesses for, of where the big inter-individual differences came from? So if it was an order effect or VI experience or anything else that might have affected people. So a guess would be a personal preference due to the before experiences the person had. For example, one participant was a musician, so he could really go and use this auditory stimulus better than other participants, for example. But I guess it would be a idea to next time to really uh, say the participants that the stimuli will or could be useful for the orientation or for the task, because I guess maybe some of the differences were created because the participant was not sure if he or she should use the stimulus for orientation or if it's just a distraction. I see. Um, oh, the, actually, there is another one uh, question for you. This was a very impressive experiment. Uh, how, <clears throat> how was special audio presented at one aspect of speci spatialization were included, such as simple surround intensity, interaural time delay? Okay, um, so as I said, my presentation we used a sound projector developed from Technische Universität Dresden, which was developed for the cave and for the site, uh, size of the cave. And we thought it would be a really all surrounding um, yeah, spatialization of the sound. But um, like we um, heard from our participants, they had a great left and right distinction from the audit for, for the auditory stimulus, but they had differences between the front and the back distinction. So yeah, that's... maybe there was a problem. Yeah, that that's quite common though. Like left and right is much easier than forth and back. I I, I think also in real life and in the research or like the hearing process. So the next yeah, question, the for... yeah, sorry. I just wanted to mention the rest. We um we did this uh with Unity, so we had there um mm -hmm. the sound source, and we could. Mm -hmm really uh, say that it should decay logarithmically mm -hmm. when you uh, mm -hmm. go farther away. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Christiane. So the next questions are for Gareth. First one is, um, do you think the quality of the speakers or headphones between the VR and the TV setup might have impacted your results? Uh, I think they would have uh, impacted the, the uh, experiment and uh, that's why we, we got the participants to wear the headphones for both scenarios. Um, we purposely didn't use the onboard sound for the HMD and the TV because they were just so wildly different. So we, uh, we used some nice uh, studio headphones. Thanks. And the further questions. Uh, so, um, by uh, Steve Canal, who is not short if maybe you mentioned it in your presentation, but did you measure anything in whether the participants were, participants were familiar um, with the artist or they were fans of Bjork? Yeah, so musical preference, um, I think that's a, a really interesting question that we will probably take with us to the, to the next stage. And um, we did ask if the participants were familiar with the track. Mm -hmm. Um, we didn't ask if they were familiar with Bjork or like mm -hmm. Bjork, um, just uh, just if they were familiar. And and to be fair, mm -hmm. a lot like they were mostly unfamiliar with the track. They they had not heard it before. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's maybe some indication as to whether they were previous they previously listened to her work or not. Would indicate they were big fans or not. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to say that they weren't big fans. But we did purposely choose Bjork because she has such a broad um, audience and it's mm -hmm. multiple multiple genres. Well, I guess it would be quite a different experience to um, to really select participants who were who would be fans of this specific performer and participants who weren't fan, fans who were completely unfamiliar and then try and induce well deduce some effects of this aspect. It was almost a case of desperation to get people into to do the experiment with us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. Yes, yeah. I know. Very difficult, especially especially with COVID, and it's it's mm. not it's not getting easier. Um, 
Um, and the last question for you, at least from the document here. Um, did you notice if anyone preferred the 2D video due to possible cyber sickness? And the, the comment is like that your experiment was very cool, which mm -hmm. I fully agree with. Thank you. Um, it was, it, it wasn't part of our uh, post task analysis, but um, just observationally, um, we had obviously uh, for a number of reasons, we have water and seats available in, in, the, uh, in the studio area where we did the experiment and uh, participants were, were not told to sit or stand um, and they were more than happy to stand in VR and mm -hmm. they just chose to sit down with a, with a drink uh, for the music video. So there was, yeah. there, there was some, something else going on there that I think needs to be unpacked further. Um, but like, like this is a, this is a pilot ex experiment that's going to inform mm -hmm. what we do next and mm -hmm. help us to create something yeah. really quite cool. And could you just mention again what the degree of freedom of user motion was? Were they able just to look around, to also move within the uh, scene? Six, six stuff freedoms. Yeah, they they had uh, mm -hmm. full room interaction there if they, if they mm -hmm. chose. Uh, again, observationally, I'd say the majority mm -hmm. of users chose to stand in one place. Um, mm -hmm. A few of them chose to to explore a bit more, and some of them were actually taken aback by how close they were to the orc. Um, they, they found that quite overwhelming and, and took a couple of steps back um, but that again that's just observational um, mm -hmm. we, we didn't measure uh, any sort of movements like that yeah. well of course like on such on in a pilot experiment it's maybe not so necessary but well again i think observations especially in experiments with vr are really worth quite a bit yeah fascinating Okay, and uh, well, so far I don't see any questions for um, Thomas here in the document. Lauren, have you maybe found already some on the Discord channel? No, the student volunteers are looking after that. Also, may maybe someone from the presenters would like to start it was a very uh, involving well, uh, my impression was, was a very comprehensive examination um th that you performed me yeah i it's, <laughs> yeah. It was, uh, yeah it's it's an extremely large study so it's mm -hmm. a, a method methodological design to evaluate four different methodologies mm -hmm. and you can imagine the amount of statistics that's involved in doing something mm -hmm. like that so there's uh, like yeah, for the direct scaling, you have to do ANOVA, but then for indirect scaling, you have to do other different models to you to evaluate that. Mm -hmm. So you can't just throw it in an ANOVA. You have to do yeah. um, things like uh, Torsten's case five statistical analysis, which we checked and did it through other statistical models. And the post hoc analysis is also different. So trying to squeeze that into like the page yeah, limit. It's a, yeah, it's, it's, it's very intense. And obviously, this is type of study. Time. Where yeah obviously this is type of experiment where it's really focused on rigid statistics but would you be able also to share with us some details of maybe user behavior like do, do you have any such information i can maybe even share the screen again maybe just to give you some uh, ad, of like, course why not mm -hmm. yeah if there's if i don't want to take up time for any of the questions if there's anything for anyone no else, so. no, no no that's uh i think we're good so far we still have 10 minutes in our session okay so I really didn't have the time to kind of go through stuff like this, but yeah, these are the kind of the scenes that we did. So we have this uh, static scene where it's just a loudspeaker involved and it's music stimuli. Then you have this animated scene where you have this like train set and like Brownian pulse noise that goes through to simulate like a train. And then you have this distraction to also add another level of uh, like mental demand on subjects. So there's research that shows if you the the increasing the amount of audio signals make it more mentally demanding for people to like pick out certain parts then you have interaction this radio which could move around so that ties the mm -hmm. visual system to proprioceptive cues and then you have a task-based system where you have to constantly keep this drone in virtual reality in the air if you let the drone sink to the floor then the audio stops and you you need to play the drone because you need to evaluate the audio right so stuff like this um yeah there's it's um 
very interesting. Uh, I think maybe I even put some st stuff in some extra slides about the behavior, but or maybe I didn't. Uh, so many graphs, so many things. Um, this was actually the the people who were interested in the HRTFs and what we did here. So this HRTFs are basically the way that we can uh, map our um, ILDs and ITDs and and child reflections and stuff like this. So to create binaural audio for those who aren't, aren't sure, and then we degrade them in terms of spatial resolution. So you start with one degree in the azimuth plane resolution, which is very high. Then we degrade them in terms of five, 10, 20, and 30 degree resolution. And then for the frequency uh, um, HRTF set, we basically um, create like a smoothing effect in terms of the frequency response at every different angle. And this is done using something called principal component analysis, where you have a large amount of data and you kind of trying to categorize that large amount of data with as much with as little data as possible with its strongest components essentially yeah um any if there's any specific questions uh, or i can just uh the i think the interesting thing for me was that uh the because the pairwise comparison it's normally it's a very um popular or, or a very good um evaluation method because of it's it's basically you're presented with two auditory conditions you can switch between a and b and the power is that the subjects can only only have to concentrate on two things at once yeah so you just have to just listen to these two things but if you are presented with like 30 pairs one after the other one and mm -hmm. you then have to move around inside the vr environment to essentially induce differences between these pairs audible differences i have to like move around and explore the vr world you have to constantly move around for these new pairs that come which takes a long time it's exhausting for subjects and that's the main kind of behavioral takeaway from this that if you can just get rid of conditions that you know are terrible like oh, i've listened to this once and i don't need to listen to that again i can get rid of it and then go through that sequentially and then you you're essentially just left with one pairwise comparison at the end with two conditions which you can just concentrate on to find the winner and that's really the kind of uh, crux of um, the efficient movements so yeah. i can stop sharing this now i agree completely that like that users are well it's, it's easy to get uh, participants overwhelmed uh, i see a question in the chat which is to add to everyone so maybe it's uh, i suppose it's for thomas but maybe it's for anyone who wants to respond if i were to repeat uh, the study what would be the mode of uh, analysis step by step um mode of analysis um i guess the what statistical analysis you would do step by step right um um for, for, for each method it's it's different so for the direct scaling you could just do an ANOVA in terms of the analysis. So you can just basically throw in an ANOVA model, check for the sphericity and all that kind of stuff. And then you could just do some postdoc with some Tukey uh, postdoc analysis. Um, that's what we did here. Um, for the indirect scaling, we did essentially this. I can even go back to this now. Um, so um, this is the indirect scaling. We used the Torsten's case five model. Um, and this, what this does is it calculates maximum likelihood differences between the conditions that you're evaluating. So it doesn't give you any absolutes, but it says how likely is something to have a better quality over another condition based off of the amount of times it was eliminated first or second and so on and so forth. Um, then we did something called, uh, we mapped that basically to a scale, which is called just objectionable differences scales, which um, is similar to JNDs, if people have heard of a JND, but a JOD, doesn't imply discernibility on a single dimension. So you have like J and D in terms of brightness or a decibel is an example for loudness and uh, a JOD would categorize lots of different things that you use to discern like one similarity worth of difference between this other condition that you're testing because it's multimodal. It's lots of things that you can use to, to evaluate that. Um, yeah, the actual exact um, statistical analysis in the paper and also the the model that we use is inside the paper you can even download the source code and do it yourself so it's it's all there step by step um yeah thanks very much thomas well certainly one of uh, those papers that make the replication quite easy with, with so much descriptive information 
Um, thank you very much. So, well, we have five minutes left of the session. I don't see so far any new questions appearing. Oh, uh, I would like to uh, <clears throat> say thank you to all the presenters. Uh, it's really great work and great variety of work. Uh, guess everyone uh, can agree also that <clears throat> everyone has learned something today. So uh, I guess, yeah, I don't, I don't know uh, if we do virtual clapping, if we do a real clapping for the presenters and for uh, attendees and all the different time zones. <laughs> I guess it's a virtual one. So thank you very much. I guess we'll be rounding the session up. What do you think, Lauren? Yes, yeah, if everybody yeah. has, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so of course, well, uh, you know all the authors, you know like all the papers and there is a Discord channel. So if there are any other questions uh, that, that appear later on or something, well, you, you think about something, I'm sure everyone will be able to get in touch with the authors and continue on. Well, one-to-one uh, -one level like future discussions and maybe even coming up with some collaboration possibilities okay thank you very much thank, thank you so much yeah thanks lovely bye. to meet you bye, -bye. have a nice uh, evening day whatever it's happening and where you are <laughs> so <laughs> i'm going to stop the session now okay bye. take care bye